So, a bit of preach really, because I suppose that's what I came here to do. So if you've got a Bible, can you please turn to the book of Ephesians? We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, just two verses. Uh, so, and I'm going to be reading from the ESV. Is it behind me? Oh yeah, no, it's magic. We don't have such magic in Wales. So, uh, because it's behind me, I will read it. <laughs> Oh, it's there. Okay. Oh my goodness. It's a good job it's not my face up there. <laughs> I think I did something for you didn't I, uh, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, and, and it's really disconcerting because when they switch to you, I thought I was going to be looking at you and I was looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> and I've realised that at my age, looking at me is not good. But then I realised halfway through that on Facebook, your right hand is your left hand and your left hand is your right hand. It reverses it, doesn't it? So, and to test this, halfway through when I was speaking to you, I started to scratch my nose. You can have a look, just to, to see which, and it, it was really disconcerting. So please don't ask me to do that again, that is, because I behave like a child in the middle. So anyway, um, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Now Paul has set out what he's done, what God has done in sending Christ and the wonder of their salvation early on in the letter. And that is how the letter progresses. This is what God has done and this is what your salvation is like. This is what you have received. And you can see this progress all the way through the book. So he says, look, this is the way that it works. I chose you before the foundation of the world. Chapter 1, verse 1. Um, he predestined you for adoption, chapter 1, verse 4. In him we have had redemption, chapter 1, uh, verse 7. In him we have obtained an inheritance, chapter 1, verse 11. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, chapter 2, verse 1. But God being rich in mercy, that's a good one, um, because of his great love, 2, 4. By grace you have been saved, 2, 5. And Paul layers on these wonderful things that you have received in Christ. He wants them to know what you have received from God as a free gift. Then, he's, then what he does is that he moves to explain how the gospel came to them. And in doing so, he tells them that it is a mystery that has been revealed. Which I can see looking on at you lot. It definitely is a mystery that's been revealed. <laughs> Because that's my view from here. It is a mystery. And isn't that true? In your and my salvation, that still the wonder is that God saved me. Yeah. And then Paul argues and he says, not only was that a mystery, which we read in chapter 3, verse 3, he says, there's an even greater mystery, that God chose me to proclaim it to you. And it's, I, I, not only can I work, not work out what God has done in you, God has chosen me as an instrument so that I can share the gospel with you. And he holds and he says, that's an even greater that I became a minister of this gospel. And once he's got to that part, this is what God has done. This is the wonderful mystery. This is the, this is the amazing thing that, has, that the privilege that has given to me. He said, I want you to know what my heart is for you. So this is like Walter standing up at a church meeting and saying, this is what I believe for you. And Paul opens up his heart, and we can see in Ephesians chapter 3, and he tells them what he longs for them. What his heart is for them. And you reach in to the Apostle Paul's heart, and you see what he thinks about this new church in Ephesus. Let me read it to you. He says, for this reason... For you, I bow my knee before the Father. He said, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. This is not just an apostle speaking, this is a pastor speaking, that loves his people. 
So that you may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with the, with the fullness of God. That's in his heart. And by the way, that's in his heart for you. That's his longing. And then he explains that this is never done in isolation. That it is done by us working together as a body. In the context of a body that we work that out. And that's what chapter 4 he even says, and to help you achieve those things, by the way, I'm going to equip the saints for works of service. And then what Paul does is that he sets out in the latter part of chapter 4 and beyond what those works of service look like. So if this is what God is, has done for you, and this is what I'm praying for you, this is what the outcome will be. And he tells them that they're no longer to walk as the Gentiles do. Meaning, I don't, we, we're not going to live anymore as people who do not follow Christ. We're going to live differently. We're going to live as followers of Christ. And he sets out in detail what that will look like. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does that look like? Where's the job description, if you like? And in doing so, he says in chapter 5, verse 18, by the way, you're not going to do this on your own. Because isn't that true? It is immensely difficult to live out as a follower of Christ on your own. I fail, I muck up, I mess up. You too? So Paul says, by the way, chapter 5, verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because this is the thing that's going to help you. And in fact, that's the key verse for everything. Nothing can be achieved without neither our holiness or our behaviour, or as Paul will go on and explain later on in the book, marriage, parenting, work, because he talks about slaves. We can't do it without the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the key verse in the whole book. It isn't about duty, it's about enabling. It's about what we can do with him, not what we can do by gritting our teeth. And so he says, okay, let's Let's work out what that looks like then. What does that look like? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And then we get to verse 1. So that's where we are. Just journeyed a little bit. Probably a bit wobbly, but we journeyed. And in verse 1 he, he uses these things. He uses therefore. And if anybody knows, there's a therefore, there's a reason, it's therefore. Okay? So you have to ask yourself, every time you get a therefore in the Bible, then there's a reason that it's therefore. And he says, therefore. And this points back to the previous verses in chapter 4 and verses 25 to 31, where he says, you did live like this, and now we're going to live like that. And Paul sets out the description of that life. And he said, here's the description, you can see it in verse 32, chapter 4, where he said, it's going to be like this, it's going to be expressions of kindness. It's going to be, mean you're being tender-hearted. And by the way, it's going to mean that you're going to have to forgive one another, as Christ has forgiven you. Wow, that's a big in it. <laughs> you could put, how about that for a church? You don't need to do anything else, do you? To have an atmosphere of kindness, of tender-heartedness, and forgiving one another. I would hazard to get, I'll go, good church. Wouldn't you? I'd like to be a member of that one. That's my choice. Move to Lydney. They're kind and tender-hearted and forgiving one another. There's a target. This is not church behaviour, by the way. This is attributes of God. This is Christ leaking from us to all and everyone, wherever we are. All that we come in contact with. This is God, this is Christ, this is the Holy Spirit in us and coming from us 
and touching everybody that we come in contact with. It's not just what we do on a Sunday, it's who we are. And he continues that argument by saying, therefore, be imitators of God. Verse 1. Let me just say this. Paul is not expecting you to create perfection. Because if you want to know what perfection doesn't look like, go speak to Cammy afterwards. Because I've been married 39 years this way and I'm still trying to be the perfect husband. <laughs> and I'm failing. I've tried to be the perfect dad and I've failed. I've tried, and I'm now trying to be the perfect grandfather and I'm still mucking that one up. <laughs> Just on Monday we had our children. And I realised that, that I'm around 13 stone. And to play with a little, to a football with my little eight-year-old means that 13 stone, it's nothing. And by the way, I'm still competitive. I might be old, but I'm still competitive. And in one fell swoop, I've knocked him completely out of the way. Because I'm not perfect. And Paul is not expecting you to be perfect. But he is expecting that your motive, your heart, your longing, your decision-making process might be that you would want to be an imitator of God. That actually that you ring Walter up. Not tonight at 12 o'clock, by the way, or even after the service. And that you say to Walter, Walter, can you imagine this one, phone call for Walter? Walter be jumping up and down to Walter. Why don't you just to help me to be an imitator of God? And Walter's going to get very excited. Because it's a hard thing. It's a motive thing. It's a decision-making thing. It's something that's in you. So let me ask you a question. Because I can, because I'm in the car in a little bit, so I'm driving down towards Herefordshire, legging it from you, in fear. Do, are you here... Not because you are a member of this church, but because you desire to be an imitator of God. The imitators of God in the Greek is the word mimetai. And the word mimetai is where we get the word mime from. It's where we get the idea of portraying something, to act out, to display God. I want to display God. We are to act out the nature of God to all that we come in contact with. This is not evangelism, by the way. This is you being an imitator of God 24-7, whatever you are doing. Home, school, work, it doesn't really matter. That's the wonderful thing about this verse. It covers everybody. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we are the connection that the world has with God, <coughs> apart from nature. Now this is a radical verse because we are God in. You are God in. They, of course the person can walk down and get saved and say, you know, I was a, do you call it Simon's Yat or Simon's Yat? I know Simon's Cat, but I don't know Simon's Yat. But it, Sorry to interrupt. But, you know, and it was glorious. You could see God in nature. And by the way, that's fallen. So why? What's heaven going to look like? Going to look better than. But God has placed you uniquely where He wants you to be, because He wants you to be an imitator of Him wherever you are. The vital role of displaying God is given to all. There's no discrimination, and there's no hierarchy. That's you. Isn't that amazing? What a privilege that you have got to display God wherever you are. Now, I don't know whether you know much about the church in Ephesus. We had the privilege some years ago of going to Ephesus. It's not by the sea anymore. It's, it's, there's a harbour wall, but there's no sea. But you can see that this is a city. But when you're thinking about the church in Ephesus, I want you to think that it wasn't just in the city, it was in the surrounding areas as well. When we were on the tour there, we were told this. So there were small communities 
of Christians that made up the church of Ephesus. There were people in the city. There were people from all, all, all if you like, um, levels of, church, uh, of humanity that were in the church. So this is the farmer out in the fields, just outside the city wall, and there is one. It's fallen a bit now, but there is one. Who is ploughing his field as an imitator of God. Do you know you can do that? This is the slave in the house of the high Roman official who is imitating God as he serves as a slave. This is the worker on the dockside at Ephesus, loading and offloading ship after ship after ship, but imitating God. There's just something different about the way that he does that, isn't there? He's not moaning and grumbling. He's not the old one. That he, there's no crudity about him. He's doing it wonderfully and graciously and with mercy. This is the mom looking after her children. This is the grandmother baking for her family. This is the elder at the city gate who's making decisions with Roman officials about all sorts of things that will affect hundreds of people's lives, but they're doing it as imitators of God. It's something that we could all do. And each person is in a situation that is unique to you and important to God. There's only you doing what you do. And there's only you living where you live. And there's only you that has the friends that you have and the family that you have. And God has placed you there because it's important to him so that you imitate him in your unique place. You are incredibly unique to him. Every one of you has been placed there by God. This is not the evangelism team, by the way, or the specialist. This is you. God has placed you to be an imitator of him in your unique place. That means when you go to Tesco's or Lidl when it's built, or in the pub when you go out, or when you run, or whatever you do, whether you walk the dog, or whatever it is, that you can be an imitator of God. The people you are in contact with, many have no idea what God looks like and sounds like apart from you. Mm. Amazing, isn't it? Apart from you. Yes, they can find God in nature, but you, by living out the nature and the character of God, where you mime and portray and act like God, not perfectly, but enough so that they can see God. What is it about you? What is so different about you? It's God in you. But remember, it's not just an issue of duty, of being holy, not telling a risky joke. Because God works through you. So Paul wrote this, he said, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you. You just have to be there and have a heart and allow God to do what God does best, which is to save. You just have to be willing to be there, willing to do what he has called you to do. Yet the idea of imitation, it, uh, it occurs all the way through Paul's ministry. More than once Paul actually does a risky thing. I don't know whether I would like to do it. Walter's probably more qualified than me. Because Paul actually says that he recommends to his own people that they imitate him. I don't think that I've got to that position of asking our people yet. Don't imitate me. Because they'll all have Midland accents. And you think, why could he say that? And Paul could say that because he was an imitator of Christ himself. That was how he could say it. 
And actually his new converts had in the most part no example of faith or Christian living before him. Yes, he taught them about Christ. But he also set them an example as a follower of Christ. You can set an example for each other as a follower of Christ. You can do that amongst yourselves in serving, in loving, in caring. That's why he could say, forgive one another, remember that, as Christ forgave you. <laughs> because he's, he's going to do that. This teaching, by the way, is not new. Do you remember this from Jesus? But love your enemies and lend except nothing, uh, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Really? <laughs> and then he goes on and he says, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Choose mercy. Do you know you can choose mercy in Tesco's? You can choose mercy when you're filling up petrol. You can choose mercy. Choose mercy. It's just a, just the character of God. When you have a choice that's in front of you, you first, or mercy first, just choose mercy and leave it with God. That's not me, by the way, that's Jesus. Choose mercy. Why? Because that's what God did for you. He was merciful to you. The idea is simple. We are to make God our example and our model in all our dealings and all our personal lives. The things that most don't see. It does not say here in this verse, it doesn't say think about God. It doesn't say admire God. It doesn't say adore God, it doesn't say know about God, it challenges you to be like God. And it's important to see that God is actually more than just an example. Many errors come into the church when Jesus is presented just as an example for be behaviour. This is not just, I want you to copy something. But we remember the argument that Paul had, that he tells you first of all these great things that you have received in Christ. So we're not saved by the example of Jesus, but once saved, his example becomes meaningful to us because of what we have received. We've received mercy, be, merc be merciful. It's the same, isn't it? Do you remember this one? He said, but he who is called Sorry, but as he who called you is holy, you shall be holy in your conduct. As it is written, you shall be holy. What for? But I am holy. Because, it's, because we've been like him. So the question is, how are we imitators of God? Well, we have to go to Bible college for 15 years. Study Hebrew and Greek. That helped. Let me tell you, this studying Hebrew and Greek in Elma just confused me. But Paul actually says that there, there. It says, I want you to be imitators of God as beloved children. And children are natural imitators. My grandchildren all support, we lost today by the way, I'm in sadness. All my grandchildren support Wolverhampton Wanderers. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because their grandfather supports them and their mother supports them and their auntie supports them. And if you go to the, the if you go to the walls and watch them, you'll hear a chant that goes out. And it's something like this. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Midland speak. So, so I know you do Forest of the Deans speak. And, and, and you know, because I've listened to Walter and Annie's even worse, not a clue what Anne's been saying to me for the last week. But we keep nodding. Anyway, so Walter and Wanderers speak goes like this. We're walls, are we? So when I, I, I open the door, the kids come rushing out and they go, We're walls, are we? Now, these kids were born in Wales. 
They are taught Welsh at school, they speak Welsh, but when they see me, we're wolves, I mean. Because they're natural imitators and natural learners. What's it mean? <laughs> we are wolves. We are wolf supporters, aren't we? <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Oh, by the way, potentate is ruler. Yes. All right, king. Yes. Just for the, I know you knew it, but I don't know. The, just in case the other potentate. Of, do you remember that one in the worship? Yeah. Potentate of time, yeah. ruler of time, king of time. Oh. What's the ineffable? Sounds like. I don't know. Ask your wife. That's too. <laughs> Born in Wolverhampton, I've got any, we only use Wolves anyway. <laughs> Can somebody Google it and just, we'll do that one. <laughs> but often they, children, what they do is they do what they see their parents doing. Do they not? Do they not? Our kids did that. I don't know whether you've ever been there as a parent, that what you've done is you've left your children to play and you're in the kitchen. And out of, the, out of the lounge, you hear kids speaking the words that you have spoken to them. And there's that horror moment when you think, that is me. <laughs> and now our daughter says things like to us, she says, what you said to me, I say to the kids. There's almost a horror thing that goes on. But when we act According to our nature as children of God, we will imitate him. It's just our, it's just, okay, we, we're going to do this. We're, gonna be, we're just going to be an imitator. And as we imitate God, we represent God. And especially to those that have shut out God. You don't have to tell them, you just have to be. You don't have to argue with them, just be. It's probably, excuse me, because I know there's a couple of pastors and vicars, but apologetics sometimes has not helped us. It's just my opinion, but I'm old now, because I'm retiring soon, so I'm alright. I can, I can just bask away. But apologetics sometimes has been that my argument is bigger than yours. And the problem is with apologetics, is actually the Holy Spirit's argument is bigger than yours, and people are not saved by your great argument. They're saved by the work of God. So let me give you an example of Mr. Spurgeon, because he's my hero, okay? He and I are born about the same age. Mr. Spurgeon said this, what are we sent into the world for? Is it not that we may keep men in the mind of God, whom they are most anxious to forget? If we are imitators of God as dear children, they will be com compelled to recollect that there is a God, for they will see his character reflected in ours. And he goes on, he says, I have heard of an atheist who said that he could get over every argument except the example of his godly mother, and he never could answer that. You, you can't get over what you want. It confounds. Why? Because it's God. It's God. And Paul goes on and says, so therefore, walk in love. This is not just be lovely, by the way, which I know that you are, lovely people. But actually to love people as Christ loved you, verse 2. It was Christ who showed his love by giving himself up to death in, on our behalf. Let's shorten that. Therefore, love that we give out is giving and self-sacrificing, and it will cost you to love others like this. Oh, well, I want to be an imitator of God, okay? Then love other people. Love everyone. self with a, at a level of self-sacrifice. So 1 John 3.16 by, by this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for our brothers. This is not doing something when you can. This is doing something for somebody else at your cost. All the time. 
This is not convenience Christianity. This is sacrificial Christianity. This is how much then do you wish to imitate God? With your neighbour? With your friend? And Paul re reiterates this in his own appreciation of Christ's love. He said, the, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is a love for anyone at your cost. This is not doing what you can. This is meaning that you will go further. It actually means that you will love at your loss. In the church and at the church. We should ask, how personally should we take this demonstration of love? Is it something that, you know, we just, uh, we like it, we sing about it. Let's put it up there. Let's sing a song about love. How are we going to love for one another? Do you know, too many Christians admire love but don't do love. A few months back it was Callie's birthday and it, we were on the island of Anglesey in Eastmont. To anybody that would like to know, that's where we were. We were sitting on the, on the it was an, an October day when everything was blue. It doesn't happen very often, it answers one every five years in Wales. So the sky was blue, there were no clouds. We were sitting on in Eastmont looking out over the Menai Strait, which happened to be blue, not like your river down here by the way. <laughs> we have blue ones. And the sun reflects off them and you feel good when you've got blue river. Not brown, blue. <laughs> Say that again, blue rivers in well. And over the back of it was Snowdon. And we were with Callie's sister and her brother-in-law. And we were having a coffee and we sat for ages. And we looked at Snowdon. And we admired it from a distance. And the problem is with Christians, the problem is with me is that I admire the idea of somebody else loving somebody else but I'm not going to do it really because I'm a convenient Christian I'll do it when I can sorry too busy tonight series on Netflix how much do you love one another. How much do you love this town of yours? And Paul said this, the, the life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Amen. So therefore I'm going to live extending out sacrificial love to all that I come in contact with at my cost. Because in doing so, I display Christ. Sacrificial love given to all around you is not done for reward. It's not done for congratulations. In fact, you might not get honoured on a Sunday for doing it. In fact, you might not, you, people might never know that you do it and you may never get any reward. But it is God-like and it is God-pointing. And it is for him. And in doing so, something happens. Something happens in heavenly places. Not an earthly place, but a heavenly place. Something happens when you sacrificially love another person without reward or congratulation something happens in heaven heaven moves did you know that you can move heaven what well, you can you know when i picked up the shopping and nobody saw me this little old lady like heaven moved heaven moved how do I know that? Because we can see that it says the effect of such sacrificial love is a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Heaven is moved. That something 
sweet and pleasing and acceptable to God comes right on his nostrils and you get the smile of heaven. Isn't that amazing? But nobody saw me. But nobody heard me. Nobody noticed me. Heaven moved. Heaven moved. Angel went, what was that? Something is happening on earth. Something happened in Tesco's in Lydney that moved heaven. And the angels went, something's going on. There's a fragrant offering that's coming up and invading heaven itself. And the writer to the Hebrews consistently speaks of the work of Christ in terms of sacrifice. Do you remember all those things like birdies and you know all sorts of different sacrifices, the, the plants and animals and all of that sort of stuff? And Paul uses this same terminology, this fragrant offering that we find in the Levitical sacrifices coming from you now, please God. So as we give it ourselves with, to, love, to love one another, often unknown by many, God is worshipped, he is pleased, and heaven is moved. So do you want to move heaven? Do you want to move heaven? Do you want heaven's gaze to come down? Not by the way of going, Way! That isn't how it works. On earth, unnoticed, in heaven, you've caused the Father to be pleased. Do it for the Father. Not for success in ministry. Not so that you can become a leader of the church. Not so that you can be noticed. Do it so that heaven is moved and happy. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. We have a lady in our church, I'll close on this, I just hope that she never watches this, I'll get myself into real trouble. And her name is Ruth. And Ruth is unassuming. Absolutely unassuming. In fact, if she was here, she would be right over there. She doesn't often pray. But all the way through all the way through the pandemic, she shot. And then afterwards, when the pandemic went, finished, this is my last story by the way, because I'll see you falling asleep. <laughs> what she did is that she carried on with these people. She didn't need to now. Well, now the pandemic's over, we don't need to help people, do we? We did that. She carried on helping them. And she kept going. Um, I have the privilege of watching Ruth do this. And I have a little chuckle to myself. Because she's married to a guy that has led I don't know how many churches. And in the world's ideas, this guy is the famous guy. Now I'm sorry if you're watching this, this is too late. I'm just going to drop you in it. Do you know in the pecking order of heaven? That one. The one that still goes, takes a car to a 92 year old lady who actually turned up to church because of her just a week ago. She brought her to church. Who went to the funeral of this lady's sister who died at the end of Covid. I went to. She's the one that heaven applauds. Be that person. Don't do it for your fame. Do it for the atmosphere of heaven, which you will go in. Your well done may not be applauded, but heaven will smile upon you. That's the deal. And actually, I think I'd rather have heaven than promotion. Wouldn't you? Walter.